welcome to our little Q&A session. And this was brought about because I used to run these a long time ago. And I think I started running these in lockdown um, because it was a nice thing to do to see people's faces and have a little bit of a chat about some of the things that have been troubling them with their pelvic floor. So it was suggested that it was um, a really nice thing to do. And um, so I thought that I would come back in and, and, and take some questions. So we've had quite a lot of people email in questions, which we're going to try and get through, but also think about like why you're here and what you want to learn. So I'm just going to give you a very brief overview about myself and what's brought me to work in the world of women's pelvic floors, mainly. So I am Nikki Scott and I run UK Hyperpressives along with my partner, Richard Peterson. We run training for the general public, but we also run training for health and fitness professionals as well. So we have specific courses for people to become qualified as trainers. Um, so that there's more of us to spread the amazing word about hyperpressives. And it's a, really my purpose to change the way we think about women's health because it's very much stuck in the dark ages. And a lot of women that come to me when I'm having a discussion with them, they're very unaware of other holistic treatments. They're not really signposted to those treatments by anybody. And I'm not really just talking about things that I offer, um, but things that you know I would just generally recommend for certain conditions. So my mission really is to drag women's health out of the dark ages and to also obviously talk about the power of hyperpressives. So I found hyperpressives um, probably about 12 years ago now. And I had twins in my thirties and had serious issues with incontinence ever since I had them up until the point that I found hyperpressives. And I really kind of had gone down the route of pelvic floor, um, traditional pelvic floor work for incontinence, which is pelvic floor squeezes. And pelvic floor squeezes have been given to women to do since the Victorian ages. So this treatment that's supposed to be the gold standard to fix everything to do with your pelvic floor Unfortunately, the treatment just hasn't really evolved with what we've learned about the body over the years. And so I'm, I'm really making it my mission to try and change the way we think about our body and understand that there are many holistic alternatives, hyperpressives being one of them. So as this is a Q&A session, I am going to start working my way down some of the questions that were sent through. What I would really like you to do is if you haven't sent me, I know some of you that are here have sent me some questions, but if you haven't sent me any, then really think about what it is you want to know as I'm talking. And if I don't cover it, then just pop it in the chat. Okay, so you can use that chat box at the bottom. Hi, Sylvie. Oh, she's disappeared. Hi. Uh, where you gone? Oh, there you go. Um, we, we've already started. It's being recorded, so um, you haven't really missed anything too much. I just did a very brief intro. I'm still we got up. Okay, cool. So first question is from Sylvie, <laughs> which is quite weird that you've just come in. And Sylvie asked, how can she do hyperpressives if she has IBS and leaky gut? So... One of the, what, what we always used to teach people when we were teaching trainers was that IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, was a contraindication, but it's a, it's not a massive red flag. It's more of a, if someone was in a flare up and they had a lot of inflammation and a lot of discomfort and they felt very bloated, then there would be times within, you know, their there's within their symptoms when you wouldn't do hyperpressives so when they're at their worst when they're having a flare-up you don't do it if you've got IBS you can definitely do it but just when you're really you know if anyone suffers from IBS then you know a really bad bout of IBS can cause a lot of discomfort and 
obviously adding to that discomfort would be hypopressive. What I would say to people is it's very individual and you can still probably do the lateral breathing. And you can probably still do the lateral breathing in some of the postures. It is really just the breath hold that creates the vacuum that would cause issues with um, disc even more discomfort when you're doing hyperpressive. So it may cause quite a lot of pain, the vacuum, because we're restricting space and IBS causes inflammation and inflammation needs space. Does that make sense to everyone? So although when we teach this course to um, health and fitness professionals, we, we, we talk about it being a contraindication. It's not a true contraindication. It's not one of those ones where you would definitely not be allowed to do hyperpressives. It would only be listening to your body when you're in a flare up, leave it, leave it to one side until that's you've recovered a bit and then, and then do hyperpressives after that. So hopefully that answered your question, Sylvie. So we have a question from Jenny Fennick and she asked, have you ever heard of a TENS machine helping urge or stress incontinence? So I don't really have an awful lot of knowledge in TENS machines, but I did do a little bit of research. And what I believe a TENS machine, a vaginal TENS mach machine would use a metal probe to activate your pelvic floor muscles to contract and release, which is basically what you're trying to do when you do a pelvic floor squeeze. So I know that in the NHS, it's often prescribed to someone who struggles to do pelvic floor squeezes. So what, what the machine will do is it will add a stimulus and that will mean that you'll get that contraction. So you'll basically be doing it with the aid of a machine. Now, you all know my view on pelvic floor squeezes anyway, that they're very limited and that they do, they're, they're just given out as a blanket for any, any type of pelvic floor dysfunction. But if we're thinking about stress and urge incontinence, again, it really, really depends on all the different variables. Like if someone's got a scar, so if you've got a birth scar, then the scar itself can be very restrictive in that area. And so even using a TENS machine isn't gonna give the scar tissue the stimulus to contract and relax. So there's it's a, it's a difficult one to answer because I personally haven't had experience of them helping uh, stress and urge incontinence improve using a TENS machine. But I know that it is something that is prescribed through the NHS for people who struggle with doing pelvic floor squeezes. So hopefully that answers a bit of a roundabout answer there really, but hopefully that answers that question. Um, can hyperpressives help prevent vaginal atrophy? What I would say with that is that it may slow the process down. So because we're improving the function in the pelvic floor, and the whole area, because everything's connected, will improve the tissue, will improve the blood flow, will improve the nerves, will improve everything by doing hyperpressives. So I haven't had any cases where someone said that it stopped that from happening. I mean, I'm probably the biggest case study there is really, because I've been doing hyperpressives for 12 years and I started doing them for stress and urge incontinence. So for me, that was my main driver. And if anyone knows my story, within three months of doing hyperpressives, I had no stress and urge incontinence and it's never returned. I mean, I do them regularly and now I've gone perimenopause, menopause, and I'm out the other side. And as far as I'm aware, I've got, you know, and, and usually um, vaginal at atrophy is associated more with the aging process and menopause and postmenopause. And what I would say is that for me personally, it's all good down there. <laughs> Sharon is caring guys, Sharon is caring. So um, I can't give a definitive answer, but what I would say is using myself as a, as a, um, as a case study, 
I'm 55, 56 this year. And so at the moment, everything seems good. Yeah. Right, let's come to a question in the chat because we have one. Let's have a look. What have we got? Okay, so Sunita, fantastic question. Can men be treated too for hernia, back pain, and diastasis recti? And the answer is a big fat yes. Because men have pelvic floors, and they're they're the, the only difference really is the obvious one, and the fact that there are less um pelvic organs, you know, they haven't got that whole reproductive system. So they've actually got more room in that pelvic cavity. So, but there's still a pelvic floor there. And as we know, pelvic floor diaphragms should be best friends. They should be talking to each other and they should be, you know, hanging out and, you know, getting to know each other. And in men, when especially men that have um, po poor posture or men that have jobs that are very repetitive, like sitting at computers and lots of heavy lifting and stuff like that can change their posture and then it starts to change that connection through the pelvic floor and the diaphragm. And I don't think men ever really think about their pelvic floor in the same way as women do. You know, we we usually, we, the, only, the first time we think about our pelvic floor is when we have a problem with it or when we're um, going through pregnancy because that can obviously be a time when we start to have issues. So what hyperpressives will do for men is pretty much the same as what it does for women it will get that connection between the pelvic floor and the diaphragm they will get them reconnected get them talking to each other again and obviously they don't work in isolation there's everything is connected and into a web so it fires up all the other deep core muscles it fires up all the other muscles that need to kind of start talking to each other better so by doing hyperpressive posture will improve so that will decrease tension where we don't want it and in improve tension where we do need it so those are our big stabilizing muscles our big back muscles our glutes and reduce tension where we don't need it which is usually at the front of our body which is what ends up creating that pull forward and poor posture with regards to diastases diastases can happen in men when they've been overweight and they've lost weight um they've had that um because of diastases is that abdominal separation and in pregnancy the walls, your you, these are your rectus muscles, and when you when you're growing that baby, the gap between those rectus muscles is growing as well, held together by a really nice strong sheath. So in during pregnancy, you have eight months or so, and you're you're not at this size the whole eight months. It's growing, so it's just stretching to accommodate. And when you've had your baby through good rehab, that should go back to somewhere close to where it was before, and the sheath should get nice tensile strength. So when we don't have those things happening, whether it's a man or a woman, we end up with a bit of a weakness. And then, especially with men, they'll go back to sport, they'll, they'll, they'll go do um, heavy lifting and stuff like that. And that's when we can have that problem with hernias. Men's diastasis, though, especially if they've been overweight for a period, a longer period of time than a pregnancy, which let's face it, we know lots of guys that have got that big round belly and they may have had that for a while. That means that they've had an abdominal separation. They've had that diastasis maybe for years. So the first thing to do would be to think about losing some of some excess body fat and then working on rehabbing the diastasis. Because if there's excess body fat, that's going to cause it to still just stay where it is. So often we see men that have kind of had a bit of a transformation. They've lost lots of weight, but they're left with a lot of weakness through that center line because it's been really stretched for a very long period of time. And then when there's that weakness there and they lift, which is what I was saying earlier, or they do exercise or they do, do all the things that they think are right, that can then cause pressure on that weakness through that center line. And that's when hernias happen or inguinal hernias similar. So groin hernias can be from, um, basically hernias happen because when you do things like heavy lifting or a manual job, you are creating big rises in what we call intra-abdominal pressure. 
And that's what is building up inside you. And we are like this pressure canister that, that has to control it. And if everything's functioning properly, then it's all good and that, that pressure dissipates. But if you have any weak spots like a bad back, weak pelvic floor, weak center line, then you can start to have problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. So hyperpressives will help to reconnect everything, get everything working together. And it does has massive improvements in posture, which often contributes to weak areas like pelvic floor and center line. Awesome question. Thank you. So a question from Mary. Um, she says, I mentioned a couple of times uh, on some of the courses she's done that that we need to ch have a change of mindset, but she's not sure what I meant. And I think that thinking back about it, I think it's to do with the way we think about our body. So textbooks, the GP, very much talk about the body in a way where we treat an area that isn't working. We don't look at the whole body. So while I know it's a bit crude, but I say they focus on your whole and not your whole. Yeah. And, and so if you can change your mindset to think about the fact that every single bit in your body is connected. Um, if anyone's on my email list, which I think quite a lot of you are, I, I there was a link there for Body Worlds ex exhibition that I went to see many moons ago when I was... Um, doing my massage qualification because I wanted to understand all of the systems in the body more. And it's it's a method of plasticizing and then looking at the body in layers. So one of the exhibits is literally a slice of a person and you can kind of see from that everything that's connected. So your lymphatic system, your fascia, your muscles, your skin, your bones, everything is just connected together. So the chances are that when something goes wrong in you, where you feel pain, that's a bit of a red flag. And it's kind of saying, well, look, there's a problem here. There's in the system, we've got some malfunctions. But the thing being is that we tend to really ignore those until something major happens. And especially with things like the pelvic floor, if we've got an incontinence issue, it's very embarrassing. It's not very nice and you want to get it sorted out. But often there are other little red flags that would have, your body would have alerted you to that you just ignored because it was nothing. Oh, it was just a little twinge here. It was, my knee was a bit, my ankle was a bit whatever. You know, all of these things contribute together. So it's just th changing your thinking from, you know, I've got this issue with my pelvic floor, so that's where I must focus. And I must do my pelvic floor squeezes to hold on a minute, what else is going on here? Have I got any birth scars? How's my posture looking? Do I have any other injuries to my joints, ankles, knees, hips, anything like that that's going on, scar tissue? So birth scars, as well as any other scars on your body, will create a pull and tension. So I do think that is what Mary was asking me. Um, she put, I think it was when we, we were talking about the relationship with, between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor. Yes, because a lot of people, when they're told to do pelvic floor squeezes, they don't realize that there is this synergistic relationship between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor, which means that they literally are best friends. They move together, they do everything together in a properly functioning, healthy body. But over time, you know, age, poor posture, childbirth, um, repetitive activity, so maybe your job can cause them to fall out. And that's the same with a lot of the muscles that are supposed to work together synergistically, they just don't. So then we get an overuse somewhere or an underuse somewhere, and it isn't necessarily that we're weak or strong. It just means that that connection's just been lost a bit. It's a bit fluffy and we need to kind of bring it back and sharpen it up and connect everything together. Um, what else does she say? So Mary says, what do you think about doing Kegels as well as hyperpressives? I have been doing them both, partly because I'm going to see a gynecologist in a few months about my prolapse, and I've, I've been advised to do Kegels in the meantime. I was doing Kegels before I found out about hyperpressives, so I decided to continue them at least until I've seen the gynecologist. 
I'm certain that hyperpressors are helping to improve my prolapse, but I'd be interested to know if you feel there's there's any conflict in doing Kegels too. It's a really difficult one to answer and it is getting a bit dark on this. So I am gonna give you my... Let's see how we get on. Oh no, I've definitely got a shaft of light on my head. Anyway, we'll have to put up with that one. Otherwise you won't be able to see me. Um, so my take on Kegels is that if that's the only treatment you've been doing and you're seeing some positive results and you're enjoying doing them, then there's no reason to stop doing them. But knowing what we know about the body in that Kegels just literally target the pelvic floor. They don't look at its best friend, the diaphragm at all, unless you're being told to do some breathing with your pelvic floor exercises. So for a start, I don't get that because we need everything to work together. We don't just need the pelvic floor to be strong or weak. We're very much told with Kegels that, that you know, they're going to strengthen everything, they're going to pull everything up. It's going to be this support system. And yes, the pelvic floor has lots of ligaments and connections into it from your pelvic organs, but it's not like it's a bit of rigid scaffolding. It is a very pliable, movable, um, bit like any of your muscles. It moves and oscillates with you. And that comes from getting your diaphragm to work properly. So... That's my problem with Kegels. However, you know, I'm never gonna say to you, don't do them if you're getting success with them. Yeah, if you're finding that your symptoms are relieving and you, you know, you, you continue to do them and everything continues to get better. But I would say that for most people, their positive results come within the first year of doing them. And then really they don't get past that first year. So that's great if you have, you know, no symptoms after the first year, brilliant, but you still need to keep doing them. But if after that first year, you're still not where you want to be and you've been signed off really, all, all you're going to end up doing is delaying slightly going for surgery or that because that's the next route that's offered to you by the medical profession. So it's a difficult one to answer definitively. If Mary, you feel that they are adding some benefit to what you're doing, then by all means, carry on. Personally, I never, ever, ever do pelvic floor squeeze. I am not bothered whether I can feel, my, you know, if I try to do one now, whether it feels strong, weak, whether it feels like I'm really clenching. I never try and stop the flow of my urine. I just do hyperpressives for that connection because that's what works for me. Good. <laughs> right, Diane, I've got your questions here. Um, so Diane says, how much should I expect my tummy to suck in? Are we talking about the vacuum? Yes. So in the beginning, which is where you're at, because you haven't been doing this for very long, all we're really looking for is an understanding from your body to have a slight subconscious reflex, which may mean that you get um, a feeling of everything sucking in, or it may just mean that your ribs slightly move apart. For most people in the beginning, when they're learning it, it's a very small movement. And over time, that vacuum will deepen. But how, how quickly and um how deep doesn't really bother me because actually getting that slight movement and some form of vacuum is what's important because it means that we're activating that subconscious reflex does that make sense yeah. if you want to add anything if i haven't answered it diane then just type away in the chat box um you put in here i suppose rome wasn't built in a day and, and that's right i think with with all of these things we all really want a quick fix. We want the pill. We want something we can take that will take that away. Um, and with our body, especially, um, again, it can be age dependent. You know, the, the, the longer you leave doing anything like this, the more time you've had not doing it, if you see what I mean. So it means that there's a bit of catch up to put in play. But it is never too late to um, make a difference and to you know, improve your symptoms. 
So I'm not saying to you that hyperpressives will cure everything. It's brilliant and that's all you should do. You can tell that from my language. However, majority of people don't know about hyperpressives, haven't felt the power of it, and it could really, really help them out and really kind of sort their life out so that they can get on and do exactly what they want to do. So, yeah. Um, not sure how to get this apnea breath. Well, that is the vacuum, Diane. So an apnea breath, the apnea, all apnea means is to stop breathing. Yeah, so what when we do that breathing, we do rest breaths and we do breath holds, which create a vacuum. So don't be confused by language. Yeah, breath hold is what, hold your breath is what apnea means, or stop breathing is what apnea means. So when you hold your breath and you, you start to get a bit of a vacuum, that is that breath. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, should I be taking a ghost lateral breath in order to get the apnea effect? It's not an apnea effect, it's a vacuum, okay? So remember that, that it's just language. It's, you hold your breath to create the vacuum. And no, you shouldn't be trying to create it, which is what you'd be doing by doing a ghost lateral breath. So going to take another breath. Sometimes I teach to sniff a flower. If people are really struggling, when you hold your breath, imagine sniffing a flower. Don't actually sniff it, obviously, because you'll take air in. But that can help you with that feeling of opening your ribs that we want on its own. Does that answer that? Yeah. It, I mean, if you're confused, if there's anything else I can help you with, then um, just type it in the chat box. Um, you've put, I think I'm getting there, but maybe I need to be more patient. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a matter of time, really. Um, and also, you haven't moved on to all the positions yet. Maybe you should. So what I usually say to people is, because you're using the online program, I would not worry about absolutely nailing every posture before you move on. Yeah, so get a good feel of the position. Make little alterations. Work on your proprioception. Work on understanding where your body is and how to correct it without looking in the mirror and then just move on to the next position okay lovely oh, we've got another question in the chat good okay so pauline says does being overweight slash menopause belly have any bearing on the efficacy of hyperpressive no no because anybody any size um can do hyperpressives it won't look the same but then you know we're all different shapes and sizes we're all made differently um and so if you if you have a bit of a menopause belly it won't make any difference to what's going on internally you should still be able to activate your diaphragm by doing the lateral breathing and in doing that, start to get a better connection to your pelvic floor by doing the lateral breathing. And then the breath hold just amplifies the effects of the lateral breathing. And the postures, as long as you'll be able to uh, do the postures, they're working on postural tension. So it makes no difference, big, small, tall, short, whatever size you are, it won't make any difference to how well it works. It can still work for you. Great question. And then Lynn says, what does hyperpressives do for scar tissue, especially birth scars? So I would say on its own, it's not enough. So this is where you would need to be doing a bit of massage yourself. So C-section scars and um, episiotomies and birth tears, um, the tissue never goes back to how it was. They don't sew you up. They don't reconnect you as you were. So I mean, it's the same with any scar on your body. You know, you know, that's why you have that mark there. There's scar tissue there. So it can become very granular and very stuck. And especially like, so in, I'll use myself as an example. I had an episiotomy and um, I'd already done quite a lot of pelvic floor work before I had my boys. 
So my pelvic floor was quite tight, which is quite unhelpful. Um, although that's kind of what everyone's saying is the gold standard. It needs to be really, really super strong. And, and actually that was quite unhelpful for me. Add to, get, add to that then a scar, which kind of caused that tension and puckering and pull on our myofascial web. I found that no amount of pelvic floor squeezes were going to help me because the, ten, the, the tight areas of the scar tissue were getting tighter and the, the, the stretched areas were also incapable of moving. So my stress and urgent continence got a lot worse by doing Kegels. And it's only really like in the last five or five years or so that I've, I've gone down that rabbit hole of scar tissue and actually realized that I've got some work to do on my episiotomy scar as well, because it's quite, um, it's quite, it can be quite painful, not anymore, but it can be quite painful. So you, you really need to be doing some massage of your scars um, just to help release some of the tension that's there, especially if you know you've got areas that are hypertonic or you're suffering with incontinence or you've got a prolapse because the, the tighter that scar, the, the muscles are around the scar, the more they're unable to move and more of a pull they're going to create. So that's going to mean that the organ that's prolapsed is going to just move out of position even more and actually make things worse. So just going back to the original question, what does it do for birth scars? Um, it will help release some of the tension. It will help get the t more blood flow to the tissue. It will help get everything moving a bit. But in some cases, like I had to have internal pressure point release done by a women's health physio. And you can buy wands that you can do that as well if you've got um, really tight areas in inside. But, you know, so there may it may be a case of try doing a bit yourself if you're confident with that. And you should be able to look at that and be able to you know do stuff with your scars and then if doing hyperpressives and the little bit that you've been doing yourself isn't enough then it may be that you need to um seek out someone that can help you with some internal work or even just to do a little bit of work and explain how you can do it yourself because i think that's what we want we want to feel empowered to do it it's our body and, you know, we want to kind of take ownership for that and, and be able to do stuff ourselves. Does that answer your question? So in some cases, hyperpressives alone will really help with your scars. And in other cases, they, they, work, they won't. You'll need to find other interventions. Christine says, I have a client I do hyperpressives with. And she told me the other day that she consciously pulls up her pelvic floor before the breath hold just to confirm she shouldn't do that. Nope, she should not. There should be no conscious pelvic floor contraction. Um, oh, I didn't wanna do that. There, yeah, there should be no um, conscious pelvic floor contraction. That's that. I think that's the thing is that people try to combine stuff. And what we're trying to do is, so your muscles, all of the muscles in your body work on a conscious and a subconscious level. So if, for example, we know that there's dysfunction in the pelvic floor and we're told just to, to train one part of those muscles, consciously contract, consciously contract, consciously contract, release, contract, release, then we're never going to get both working together because the subconscious almost goes to sleep even more. So I don't see any benefit in doing a pelvic floor squeeze while you're doing your hyperpressives. Like I said, if people are doing Kegels and they're quite happy with the results they've got from them and they want, they feel like they need to strengthen their pelvic floor that way, then I'm not going to stop them. Um, but thinking about myself, I never, I never do anything with my pelvic floor when I'm doing hyperpressives. And, and if I'm honest, I don't feel it moving when I'm doing the lateral breathing. I can feel a pull from my vacuum um, in certain positions much more strongly than others. But is it is it like, it's like almost like doing a pelvic floor squeeze, but you haven't done it, yeah? So I can kind of feel my, my pelvic floor really contract and pull up, but I'm not doing that. And that's what we want. We want that, the, the muscles to work when we need to, them to work, yeah? Not always consciously having to cue them to work. Does that make sense, Christine? I would say that you don't need to be combining 
pelvic floor squeezes with hyperpressives because during hyperpressives we're trying to tap into more of a subconscious contraction or autonomic contraction. Marvellous. Right, there's no more in the chat, so I'm going to come to some questions. So my client, um, I think you pronounce her name, Krithika. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, she's been suffering postnatally with a lot of bloating and like mummy tummy. And so she's been doing hyperpressives to um, help to reduce some of that. So what she's asking is what if what if she's still bloated after months of doing hyperpressives? And then how long to consistently do the method before seeing the bloating go away? And why does my abdomen and body feel unnatural and uncomfortable and sore when I pull my abdomen up and in? It makes the bloating almost go away, but hurts. And then she put, no, I'm not sucking in, I'm using the technique. So she's allowing it to happen subconsciously so i emailed her back because um i think there's more going on than just um bloating from or that pooch from having a baby and i would say that it's probably more to do with inflammation within her gut or inflammation within her system and there is some history i know she won't mind me sharing this of endometriosis so in some cases uh, what i would say is that if the, if there's internal inflammation that that is aside from things like IBS then um it it needs further investigation really I don't think that hyperpressives on its own will cure the bloating because that it sounds like it's more from inflammation so what hyperpressives will do postnatally which I know that, that she is is that it will get everything reconnected and it will mean that she'll be much stronger more stable it will mean that she'll have less pelvic floor issues. So that's the, the amaz amazing sign. It's going to prevent things when she's older from, from being, you know, getting worse because um, she's been doing hyperpressive. But in terms of the bloating, I feel, having delved a bit deeper, that it's coming really from something else. Right, on to Helen. So, <laughs> don't laugh, Helen. Helen says, um, what is the age range of people taking up hyperpressives? That's a really good question. So um, youngest, I, I mean, it's, it's a difficult one to answer. It, within my own clientele, most of the people I see are perimenopausal, menopausal women or women that are out the other side because you're not thinking about doing anything preventative when you're young enough to make things work properly and you know you should be doing preventative stuff so you could be doing hyperpressives as a teenager um just because it's a really good practice to keep your posture good and um, keep everything connected and to mean that you'll um end up with less problems postnatally and then newly postnatal ladies i i mean i i do have a few newly postnatal ladies but what tends to happen is that they'll either postnatally have a disaster so they'll have um, a, a severe prolapse, they'll have something else that's that's gone on because of a traumatic birth or a difficult pregnancy. And then they will come to me. Or they'll go through the, the health system and they'll, you know, they'll get a bit lost in the health system and they won't, because hyperpressive is not being that work very well known about. Um, what tends to happen is that a lot of women postnatally are not given any rehab whatsoever. It makes me very cross. If they had rehab, they, if they were just told that they will need to do rehab because every single woman who gives birth should do rehab. Yeah, Whether you think you've got a problem or not, you've just carried a child for however many months and then birthed it. So you need rehab. Your body just doesn't go, oh, I'm all right now, thanks. It takes between three and five years for that healing process to happen. And even then, without the correct rehab, you're not going to kind of be where you want to be. Um, younger people, so younger women that have children tend to recover better, but that is just an age thing because tissue will recover but much better anyway. So women that are newly postnatal, unless they have a severe issue, don't tend to come to me. 
um, as a preventative. And that's really what we should be doing. We should be getting them there before then they just leave it and they start to have a little bit of leakage in their 40s. And then, you know, when they start to hit perimenopause, it starts to get worse or they start to get other symptoms. And then they're shocked by the fact that they have a prolapse, but there was no rehab given. And that's where the gap is. That would have maybe prevented that from even being a thing. But most of the people that I see are kind of um, late 40s, um, all the way into their 60s and 70s doing hypopressives. Yeah. Because the most people get to a point where they they've just been told that they they're, they're going to need surgery, and they don't want to be messing around with their body, so um, they seek out a, a more holistic alternative. Um, are most new mums or people looking for solution to their pelvic floor issues that haven't been satisfied with Kegel exercises prescribed by the NHS? I think a lot of um people that use Kegels get very frustrated. Um, that they don't really get the results that they think they're going to get. Bearing in mind what I said, the postnatally, you take between three and five years to really kind of be through it, the recovery, and um, that can really be speeded up by doing more holistic treatment and proper rehab. Um, I, as, the more children that you have, the, the worse it's going to get as well. So if you... What's tending to happen now is that women wait until they're older to have children and then they have them in quite quick succession. So when, um, so for example, my mum, she was quite young when she had me and my sister. And I think that that, you know, women very much used to get married, you know, and, and have children sort of as part of the part of what they did when they were quite young. And, and now it's more about career and lifestyle and then, um, settling down and having children later on in life so age does play, play a role in recovery as well so even if you're having children into your late 30s early 40s you can be at a slight disadvantage for your recovery as well so when we say three to five years it may even be longer so thinking about hypopressives it's much more of a long-term solution but if it was part of a rehab package given to you from from your after your hospital appointment you knew about before you even went into birth then we wouldn't have this issue it'd be just common knowledge that you were going to need to do your own rehab if you chose not to then that's up to you but it, it wasn't it isn't just your midwife or your health is to saying oh make sure you do your kegels and that's it that, you know, there's a sheet that shows you how to do them and that's literally your rehab and it's just rubbish when your whole body has been through what it's been through, there's there's a lot of stuff that needs to, to happen, really, to put you back together again. Um, what else have we got, Helen? Um, do you think the age range reflects pelvic health training knowledge and access over the decades? I think I just answered that, didn't I? Yeah. Um, having had my children in the 80s, pre-computer age, I'm most aware of pelvic health info came from women's magazines and what you were told during prenatal classes. But now with the internet access, you can Google almost anything, although this isn't always a good thing. No, it isn't. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, there's good and bad to both, but what you've got to remember is, you know, you, you had children in the eighties, but it was still pelvic floor squeezes. Yeah. And now it's still pelvic floor squeezes. And when my mum gave birth, it was pelvic floor squeezes. And, you know, it, the ridiculousness of it is that no one's ever thought that, we could stop a lot of surgeries happening and prevent a lot of things from happening just from something really simple like breathing and posture or some scar release work or um, having a good massage regularly or you know I know we know about these things but if we had a rehab package where we did specific rehab mobility exercises um, targeted at postnatal women we would have far less problems when we're a bit older well I'm not saying it, it wouldn't it wouldn't happen but um we just don't have that in place for people okay so uh do you think there would be a benefit introducing hyperpressors to teenagers yeah so um I know some athletes use hyperpressors in their training yeah so um really we say as, as young you know, as soon as you, if you've got children of a young age it, 
as soon as they can engage with it, you can get them doing diaphragmatic breathing, for example. And certainly for runners, it's been it's um, really good for like their endurance. It's really good for like if they're feeling quite nervous um, before a race, then they can use that breathing technique to to kind of reset the system. Um, it, it it improves red blood cell count. So with athletes, it will help their endurance. We've kind of already said that. Um, so yeah, I mean, really the young and, and especially for for girls as well because by putting it in place before they're even thinking about settling down having children, you're giving them the power to be able to use that through the rest of their life um, as as a really quick tool to to kind of help with any issues they might have or to prevent them. So yeah, I mean, my sons are 23. Um, they have both been in the gym since they were about 16 um, doing you know, they, they were scrawny little te teenagers. You know, you look back at pictures of them and, they, you know, like tiny little arms and legs and you look at them now and they're really built and really muscly and they, you know, they they love going to the gym. Um, and hyperpress is, is part of their life, but not enough. So, for example, one of my sons has recently hurt his back, um, not doing weightlifting, but just doing, like, doing his job twisting moving and he hurt his back and I kind of said to him right okay let's go through hyperpressions again how much have you been doing what have you been doing and you know he hadn't been doing enough really so I'm trying to get him on a regime of doing like 10 minutes a day or 10 minutes as a warm-up before his weights so that it's going to give him that system reset because a lot of bodybuilders as well don't really have all of that lovely flexibility and mobility and and that that they might look really muscly and great but it, their body doesn't move properly and that's really important as well remember i said everything's connected so if they're really stuck in their joints and really struggle with it, like shoulder mobility that's not going to be great for other areas in their body so that is a red flag so you know there's benefits of being super fit and muscly but there's also um downside but yeah really with with kids um it's something it's something simple like diaphragmatic breathing can be so good for mental health as well that's like the watch word isn't it at the moment with kids is that they're kind of caught up in this anxiety and stress of their life and it's a really good uh, way to reduce that so yeah it's a really good question um and then are there any nhs regions in the uk offering hyperbolic training yeah so um i did mention that we had a whole course on the Isle of Wight. So if anybody lives on the Isle of Wight today and you go to St. Richard's Hospital, then they have, all, well, they at the time we did the course, all, all of their physios were trained in hyperpressives. So they know about hyperpressives. So basically what happened is we, we did a freebie to some physios in a hospital and so there were some people from the Isle of Wight and one of them said to me, I'd really love to get this into, um, into our hospital and get you know get using it so would you be open to running a course and very long story short that we ended up going over there and, and running a course for like 25 of them I mean there were there were yoga teachers there were lots of different um modalities there but there was a lot of physios so what we really would like the the, the frustrating thing with the NHS is that there isn't one person that holds the purse strings they all have their own trusts so although we got quite easily got into that hospital and got people trained, we would have to go through a really lengthy process for every single hospital, NHS hospital in the UK and do like a bid and do, and it just, you know, it's just when you're trying to push something forward like we are, it's really, really hard to, um, to kind of get the impetus to do that. But yes is the answer. If you go over to the Isle of Wight ever and you need to use the, the hospital there, then they're all trained in high professors. <laughs> right. Um, any more questions? Yes, we've got some going in here. So, um, so Sunita says, assuming that the postures, arm, hand, foot flexion also links with the lateral breathing and pelvic floor, are all the postures static or is more movement introduced in, with advancement? Okay, let's go to the first part of that about the arm hand and foot positions so the arm positions are really working on the mobility of our joint 
So the shoulder joint, very, very complex. And often when we age is where we get problems. We get lots of people I see diagnosed with frozen shoulder where they literally can't hardly move their arm because everything seizes up. Um, now, what we want to do is prevent that from happening. So when we are using those arm and hand positions, we are working through the joint to blow away the cobwebs and to get everything moving as it should do. So you do have proper shoulder mobility, which is what I was kind of saying about my son. The arm positions, we are usually driving tension, isometric tension, where we've got that contraction on through the elbows to get our main stabilizing back muscles working. So creating that tension through the elbows or the fingertips in the first hand position creates tension into our lats mainly but obviously we know we're not working them in isolation we're just asking them to work in every hand position when we're doing them so that we get those big stabilizing muscles to work correctly because they're there to hold us up nice and upright which is how our posture improves so quickly with doing the postures so the feet position so on the bottom of your foot is your is a is a diaphragm You've got a, a, a diaphragm on the bottom of your foot and it connects to your uh, your pelvic diaphragm and it connects to your breathing diaphragm. And then there's another diaphragm up here. So as I said, it's all this interconnected web. So by actually drawing your toes towards you in those flexed feet position, it is activating your pelvic floor without you having to squeeze it. How cool is that? So always make sure you're drawing. Most, most of the positions we do, we're actively drawing our toes towards us. In standing, we are creating that movement forward into the front of the foot, which will give us a little bit of pelvic floor activation. So they are quite key to get everything working as it should do. So the second part of the question is, are all the postures static or is there more movement in the advanced step? Yeah, so, so your basic flow, you've got eight basic positions which are there to kind of cover all of the bases for functional movement patterns. So we stand, we kneel, we lie down, we go into all fours, blah, blah, blah. So they're all kind of copying patterns that we already do. When we start to um, learn more of the advanced stuff, we put progressions in, so more movement in to some of the arm positions and some of the postures. So in answer to your question, when you learn the more advanced stuff, you are moving more, yeah? Cool, but mostly the, the stuff that's gonna get you the, the results is always gonna be those eight basic positions. And I'm not saying that the advanced stuff doesn't because what the advanced stuff does is it gives you an extra challenge. It makes it, it takes up a little level of difficulty and it keeps you more engaged because it's not just doing the same boring routine. Although, do you know what, every single day, I get up and I do the same boring routine. I just do my basics mostly. Very rarely use the progressions. I just, it's, I don't have to think about it. I think that's what it is. It's so there that I don't have to think about it. I just, that's my little 10 minutes of peace. I've got another great question. Um, where are we? Christine, this is more of a tip that worked for me rather than a question. I found that relaxing Stretching my adductors for two minutes while I do diaphragmatic breathing before I do high presses really helps my session. Also, because you've got anterior tilt, yeah, I find that if I stack my ribs onto my pelvic floor, that makes a massive difference. Yeah. So, again, when we're thinking about rehab, um, we all know that some of the positions are really hard for some people and easier for others. So, there may be that you need to do um, targeted mobility and I do um, a more advanced class with Helen and some other people on a Tuesday morning and a Saturday morning. And we always start with a little bit of a warm up with the breathing and then we go into um, mobility. We also do a little bit of self massage because I, I can teach that. I've got a massage qualification, but all of those things, if I was going to package it up and say to you, here's your postnatal or here's your menopausal package, it would include some self-massage so whether that's your scars whether that's your diaphragm we would work that out through assessments and then we would um definitely add in some mobility that would help with how to get into your hips a little bit more or how to get into your rib cage a little bit more so you can rotate more um how to get into your shoulders and your neck etc 
So all of that would be part of it, um, built into what I would advise. So thanks for that, Christine. Brilliant. Um, what have we got left? Oh, we're slightly past the time, but we're just going to finish off. What have we got? We've just got a couple more questions to go from Michelle. Um, and Michelle said she was going to ask whether hyperpressors on their own are sufficient to relax slash strengthen the pelvic floor. Um, in most cases, I would say yes. I mean, we talked really talked about this. I know that people kind of struggle with letting go of doing keyboards because they've been told, it's been drummed into you, you've got an app for it, you know, that you must do your squeezes because you need a, a strong pelvic floor, but you don't, you know, we just we just don't need it to be super strong. We need it to be strong when we need it and to back off when we don't need it. So my opinion is that, again, if you want to carry on doing the Kegels, you can. But I do think for a lot of people, I think this is enough. Yeah. And you don't need to test how strong the pelvic floor is with stimulation or probes or whatever it is because as long as you don't have any incontinence it doesn't really matter how tight how hard you can contract because it's not about contraction it's about um, conscious and subconscious control so get really good subconscious control and that won't mean you haven't got conscious control because you have okay um but I know I feel hyperpressives really help me mentally and physically, and I feel much more in control of my pelvic floor dysfunction, although I do still suffer a bit with urge symptoms. Um, I've kept seeing a physio who continued to tell me my muscles are weak and kept recommending pelvic floor exercises. I struggled with them and felt the more I did, the less my pelvic floor moved. I've now stopped seeing her, but having been told I need to strengthen my muscles at some point, I'm wondering if hyperpressives are enough. Yeah, it's a tough one to answer, but, you know, the other alternative is Kegels and they don't work for you. So, you know, I my answer would be probably that hyperpressives would be enough. But it, it with with human beings, we all have so many different things going on in our body. It's hard to, to give you one piece of advice and say, oh, yes, that's definitely going to be enough for you, because that would be wrong, because there's lots of other things in play. So I would say, again, hyperpressives with some mobility, with some massage, all of those things together are going to make a good cocktail. Yeah. Um, and then she's just put, I do regular glute core work to strengthen the surrounding area and plenty of stretching to help with the muscle to relax. So doing all the right things, Michelle. So just stick with it. Fabulous. So... Anyone else that's here, um, I, I, Julie, you didn't answer, ask any questions. You, you don't have to. If it's just an information evening, that's absolutely fine. But if you did have a question, then I'm happy to take it. I, I actually do. Brilliant. Go. <laughs> um, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't sure what to expect. So, um, yeah, anyway. Um, actually, so I did hyperpressives oh, probably about five years ago with a friend of mine. Because she'd ended up, she was doing Kegels and had ended up over tightening her um, pelvic floor so much that she was having trouble actually peeing. Yeah. And that's how we found out about hyperpressives. But anyway, so I put my sister onto it, but she started doing the exercises herself. Um, but she can't, she said she can't lie down because every time she lies down, she gets like sciatica. Okay. So I suggested to her, starting with the standing position because I think that's actually the way I started yeah. at the time but I just wanted to ask about that can you start with the standing position yeah yeah, yeah. I mean that what... threw her off doing it because every time she did it she got pain so she's just stopped doing it but she really needs it when she's sleeping does she is she, do you have a particular setup in her bed uh I'm not sure because what I think she lies on her side actually okay so uh, just just go through the postures. Just start in standing. If it's not causing, go do the breathing within what the, the standing posture. Mm -hmm. It's we always start people off with the breathing lying down because it's actually the most relaxed position. So we're not worrying about um, what position we're in. We're not having to activate any muscles. We're not thinking about postural alignment. We're just lying on the floor. 
relaxed or lying on the bed or wherever it is relaxed. So it's a really good way to, to engage with the breathing initially when it's when you're learning something new because you can kind of isolate the breathing by not thinking about doing it in posture. But if it's more helpful for her, she can definitely do it standing up. Okay. I'll let her know. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Who else is here that's finding? Um Pauline's asked asked a question. Has everybody that's here managed to get answers to questions that they Sally, you you didn't ask ask any questions, did you? You've got a question for me. Um no, not a question as such, but I was um the lady that I did the the run the form the flow with my qualification, she was um she's hooked, which is fantastic. Um but she said to me, you keep talking about lats. She said what are they? What are they, and how do I recruit them? So mm -hmm. I explained to her what what the, where the latissimus dorsi is, and and um, and she said, but how how do I recruit it? And I have to say, because I teach Pilates, we it's really it's really important that when we say stuff like that, people say, well, how do you do that? And you think that's a really good question. Um, yeah. So we worked out a little pull down, just doing a really simple, like starting there and pulling in, you know, in the standing position is a great way of actually getting that, that awareness. Yeah. A lot, a lot of, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a complete anatomy geek. I love, I love muscles and all of that, um, as you know, um, but you know, a lot of people don't. So it's, um, it's nice to kind of be able to, it's a bit like Pilates, get them to feel it in their body. They yeah. recognise something in their body. They think, ah, yeah. So I don't know whether it was you guys that talked about pulling your, when I was training you, talked about pulling your scapula down into your back pockets. Was it you guys? I don't, I'm not sure whether it was you. Uh, I don't, it up with someone don't else. think so. Don't think so. No, but, but I yeah. quite like that cue of... Yeah. Um, you know, like when you're in position, think about then your shoulder blades and pulling them down into the into your back pockets, and that gives you that feeling it, that you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just you know, it's finding something, finding something that they can then feel in their body, and then they know, oh, brilliant. And once they get that, they they don't worry about that so much, and they can focus on the breathing more. It's marvelous. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's brilliant. Right, so is anybody else that's here that I can see um, got another question for me before we go? No, nope, that looks like a big fat no. Brilliant, guys. Well, hopefully you found that really informative, that even if you didn't ask the question, that you got something out of this. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing this more regularly. Um, next month, I'm actually going to have um, a guest speaker. Uh, I'm not going to tell you all about that yet because we have we've only spoke this morning and um, I am going to be inviting various different people on to these uh, Q and A's or well they'll be it, it'll be more talk styley with a short Q and A at the end but all related to um, health and wellness and stuff that we are all interested in so look out for that in your emails um, everyone that's here is all on my mailing list are they yeah, yeah. cool. Great. Well, you've got your newsletter coming out tomorrow with lots of nice things in there. To, um, and always a bit of a shocker at the end. <laughs> I always like to add in a little bit of shock tactics at the end. Um, so enjoy that. And I'm I'm very thankful that you joined me this evening just to learn a little bit more and to ask me any burning questions. Um, so have a good evening and I will see you all again very soon. Thank Take care, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Bye bye.